Guys, I have a confession to make. I went down to Orlando, and I only went to Disney World. In fact, I've been to Disney World many times. D Disneyland, too. This is, this is hard for me to say, but we're a vacation club family. I'm so sorry. I apologize. I know. I'll be handing my Thuzi card in the mail shortly. Let's stop messing around for a second, though. Disney is certainly a different flavor from my usual fare, but I'd be lying to myself if I acted like it didn't play a big gestational role in my childhood coaster obsession. I spent a lot of time in Orlando back in the day, and rides like Space Mountain and Big Thunder were some of my first roller coasters, so there's a lot of sentiment there. And now, Disney has just added two of their biggest new additions, Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind and Tron Light Cycle Run. For the first time in what feels like forever, I'm getting new credits at Disney. Okay, well I didn't get Tron, we didn't get to Magic Kingdom this time around, I'm sorry. But from what I've heard, I'm not missing much. The more important thing is that I got a back row ride on Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind. And now, we can do a little evaluation. What does this seasoned Thuzi veteran think about the roller coasters at Disney World? How does Disney's newest marquee attraction stand up against the classics? And how good is Disney's coaster lineup in general? Is the property a secret Thuzi haven, or is it just a waste of time and money when Mako and Velocicoaster are only 10 minutes away? Let's find out. It's time for the Disney Coaster tier list. Before we begin, though, bad news. Word has spread to me that former Disney CEO and secret puppet master Michael Eisner has snuffed Disney's long-standing relationship with Vekoma and offered the company's next roller coaster contract to Alan Schilke and his newly reformed Din Corporation. Please like this video and subscribe to the channel so we can raise enough funds to purchase a Vekoma boomerang and put it in the empty lot left by the disappearance of the primeval world so that Disney can continue its fruitful relationship with the story manufacturer. Thank you. Now before we hop in here, one more thing to note. We have to adjust the Thuzi quotient for Disney World a little bit here because it would be unfair to evaluate Disney coasters by the same standards as, say, a Six Flags park. They're aiming at different things. While I would sell my left nut to have I-305 in my backyard, I will freely admit that it would be a terrible fit for a Disney park. Much like how I would laugh at living with the land at Six Flags America, but you know I am sitting my ass down and riding that masterpiece every time I visit Epcot. So let's temporarily shift our Thuzi compass a little bit, add a little bit less force and a lot more theming. And don't worry, I will tear them up at the end like I usually would. We're going to evaluate these fellas in context. How good are these coasters as well, Disney coasters? Let's do it. First off, we have the Barnstormer at Magic Kingdom. Ooh, a kitty coaster right off the bat. Crazy stuff. And it's fine. It gets the job done. Admittedly, it's pretty light on the theming, but it's a bit more thrilling than you would expect given its stature, and it's not pretending to be anything more than it is, which is just a fun little introductory ride for kids to get their feet wet. The little plane trains are cute, and I love that the propeller spins as you cut through the wind. I definitely say it's a pretty charming ride. It's not going to knock anyone's socks off by any means, but it is more than serviceable as BB's first Disney coaster. And let's be real though, some of the big boy coasters at Disney World are barely more thrilling than this thing. <laughs> Next up, we're stepping things up a bit with the legendary Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. And this may also be a family coaster, but it's on a much bigger scale than the little Goofy Flyer. Now, back in the day, even the Imagineers couldn't resist a slice of that beautiful Arrow Mine Train pie. But they're serving dishes out a little bit less jank and a lot more theming than the standard chain park installation. Did it pay off? Absolutely. This ride is a classic for a reason. Firstly, you really get your money's worth with the ride duration. Big T is a long ride with multiple underground sections, impressive rock work, and a nearly incomprehensible layout that snakes through that fake mountain with aplomb. It's tame enough for younger kids to handle, but the trains are really long, so you can get legitimate thrills from sitting in the front or the back. Like sure, the jank is nowhere near the level of a Six Flags mine train, but there are enough tight pops and dips to give it an out-of-control feeling that occasionally adds up to something force-wise. 
The station is awesome, and I love the fact that the ride immediately dives into a cave out of the station, immersing you into its theme right away. My only complaint is the utterly ear-splitting third chain lift, which feels like it's amplified to 120 decibels for no discernible reason. I'm not exactly dreaming of this ride when I get back home, but Big Thunder always puts a smile on my face, and it was one of my childhood favorites. Third up, we are stepping fully out of family territory with one of the biggest Disney coasters, the undeniably impressive Expedition Everest. And this immensely well-themed semi-thrill coaster comfortably lands a spot in the A tier. Everest is the thrilling Disney attraction at its best, with an incredibly well-executed theme that actually stands out its own without any IP. Oh my god! Disco Yeti aside, you are immersed in the story of the ride from the moment you enter the impressive queue line to the second you step off. It's comfortable, smooth, and offers some legitimate thrills with decent positives in the truly awesome backwards section in the dark. And if you're lucky enough to grab the back rows, you can enjoy some legitimate airtime in that decently sizable dive out of the mountain. Hell, even the slow climb up the lift hill to the top of Everest feels special, piercing through the temple and ascending peacefully through the intricate rock work. It does feel like there's just a little something missing in the thrills department, maybe it's just airtime, but I still love it, and I love it more because of its infinite rewritability, which brings me to the best kept secret in the park, the single rider line. Sure, you can't pick your seat, but who cares when you can just hop on the ride two minutes later? I think my all-time single rider record in a row was 13 rides. I was an intense kid. Everest rocks. Go ride it. Up fourth, it's time to pour one out for a defunct legend, the shining star of Chester and Hester's Dinorama, the primeval whirl. <laughs> now that it has finally departed us, we can truly bask in the comedy of this attraction. Like Disney. Disney World, plopping in a barely-themed Revachon spinner and calling it a day. I miss you so much, Michael Eisner. I loved this ride as a kid because, let's be honest, this thing was one of the most thrilling rides on the property, but I'm not deluded enough to ever think that it was a good fit. Hell, the whole Dinorama section just feels like a cheap afterthought, like you were in the middle of making an intricately themed park in Roller Coaster Tycoon, but realized that you had a month to complete the scenario and just started pumping in rides to up that soft guest cap. It looked and felt cheap, it had horrendous capacity for a Disney ride, and by the time Everest came around, it was woefully outgunned. But I won't lie, I miss it. Those Revachon spinners can pack a legitimately surprising punch. Rip to a legend. Without you, Dino Land feels even more empty than it was before. Now let's move on to what is perhaps Disney World's most intense roller coaster, the Rockin' Roller Coaster starring Aerosmith. And this is another comical inclusion on this Disney property. Like, listen, I love Aerosmith. They were my first concert like 20 years ago. I own a bunch of their records. I'm still of the opinion that Rocks over here is one of the greatest hard rock albums of all time. What the hell are they doing with a launched multi-looper at a Disney park? How does the rock and roller coaster actually work as, you know, a Disney ride? In my mind at least, not very well. Don't get me wrong, I like this ride, but the rock and roller coaster manages to combine a pretty outdated and somewhat cheap theme, I'm so sorry Steven Tyler, with a layout that seems to have a bit of an identity crisis. Is it a thrill coaster? Well, it sure looks like it at first glance, with the bulky over the shoulders, inversions, and a fast launch paraded in front of the queue line for all to see. But if it is a thrill coaster, then why isn't it more thrilling? Why is 60% of the layout just aimless wandering around in a dark box, only occasionally broken up by cheap cardboard cutouts? I will admit freely that the first 10 seconds of the ride are more than enough to bring me back every time I visit, because they're pretty stellar. Like, that launch is an actually pretty good kick, but if you're gonna commit to an intense looking ride, why just stop there? Why not go full Tower of Terror with it? That ride continues to prove itself a classic. At this point though, these two rides stuffed in the corner of Sunset Boulevard are basically all that's left of MGM's original vision. As Disney continues to rip the heart out of MGM Studios, I can't help but wonder why this park has left this oddity untouched. Speaking of oddities, let's talk about the Seven Dwarves Mine Train, the fourth mountain in a park that was already full of mountains. And I'll get right to it, I don't really like this ride, and I don't think you should either. Ride-wise, the Seven Dwarves Mine Train is just a worse version of Big Thunder in every way. 
The thrills are utterly middling, but without any of the old school charm that makes a ride like Big Thunder or Space Mountain actually fun. It's just a whole lot of nothing, a roller coaster made up entirely of filler. The innovative swinging cars are basically a non factor, too. Let's be fair, though, it's a kid's coaster. It's not meant to be crazy, it is meant to entertain children. Unfortunately, though, the rest of the ride has little more to offer. And theming wise, the coaster sections just feel utterly detached from the story, and the few small theme scenes are filled with those cheap, screen faced animatronics that began to dot the Disney landscape in the early 2010s. It just doesn't feel very cohesive or impressive. Snow White's Scary Adventures did a much better job with the story. What really elevates this ride to the top of the garbage heap, in my opinion, is the horrendous queue line. And this is something that is very important when you're at the Disney Resort, because it is crowded every single day of the year. I've never seen this thing with less than a two hour wait, and it's just not worth that. Do something better with your life, I don't know, ride It's a Small World a second time or something. This thing is absolutely not worth the wait. Now we have another S coaster with the Slinky Dog Dash, one of Disney's newest attractions and a bona fide mock multi-launch. Ooh, a launch coaster. I wonder how that is. Okay, so Disney obviously made the right choice selecting mock rides, as these launches are slower than the jazzy that the elderly Florida local is gunning down the path right next to you. But it's not all doom and gloom, in fact, I think this is a pretty solid low B-tier Disney coaster. Sure, most of the ride is utterly forceless, but in the front or the back, that little run of airtime hills after the second launch actually provides the tiniest bit of lift. And while the theming is simple, it works. Most of the credit has to go to the slinky trains, which are just adorable, and the decorated connect supports in the beginning are a great addition. It just feels very cohesive. A lot more cohesive than Seven Dwarves, in my opinion, and Slinky pulls off the whole family coaster thing much more effectively. It's a coaster meant for kids that still manages to offer something for everyone. In every second of the layout, it feels like it's actually doing something. And as a result, this one might actually be worth the wait. How long is the line? Two and a half hours? Oh, fuck that. I'm going on Toy Story Mania. See ya. From one of Disney's newest to one of their oldest coasters, we finally arrived at the legendary Space Mountain. And yes, the astute among you may have recognized that this is in fact an arrow. I'm sorry guys, you know I'm contractually obligated, this has to go right to the A tier. Okay, but actually though, Space Mountain is still an awesome ride and absolutely deserves this placement. Despite its age, Space Mountain still manages to capture that childlike sense of wonder every time you bomb down that opening blue lit tunnel. It oozes old school charm without feeling dated, like the best old Disney rides. And despite what its somewhat pedestrian stats may indicate, Space Mountain packs some legitimate thrills. It's filled with arrow jank, but that means tight, sweet pops of airtime abound, especially for those sitting in the front or back. The whole experience is very much elevated by the fact that basically the entire ride takes place in the pitch black, and that awesome drop to the final helix is that much more punchy because of it. Space Mountain truly strikes that perfect balance for a family coaster, and when you add in the awesome soundtrack, immersive queue line, and beautiful theming that makes you feel like you're legitimately being transported to another planet, ripped to that legendary moving walkway though, how can you give Space Mountain anything besides high marks? I definitely can't, but I also own multiple Magnum shirts, so I'm not exactly an objective evaluator here. Enough waxing poetic about Space Mountain then, we finally come to the last ride on the list and my newest credit, Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind, perhaps Disney's most prolific addition in recent history. After many decades, Epcot finally got its roller coaster and it's an impressive one. Multiple launches, spinning cars, a kick-ass classic rock soundtrack, how does it all add up? Honestly, you gotta give it to them, this might be a perfect Disney coaster. If we ignore its near-complete lack of airtime, which is a general refrain for Disney thrill coasters, Guardians absolutely delivers in the Force Department with pretty solid launches and decent positives. But the real sauce here is the controlled spinning cars, which feel really unique and yank you around with powerful movements throughout the ride. A lot of people like to call this thing Space Mountain on steroids, and while I think they have different characters, both manage to be both chaotic and out-of-control ride experiences from start to finish. 
It's just so damn whippy and crazy throughout. I was in the back row, and I'm sure that really helped, but I wouldn't want it any other way. And Guardians has legitimately awesome pacing, and it's probably the furthest you can push a Disney roller coaster while still being family friendly and not going a little too far onto the other side. As for the theming, sure, you can barely follow what's going on, but who cares when you're having this much fun? And the pre ride experience more than makes up for the confusing ride. With a sweet queue line and entertaining pre show that manages to set the scene pretty well, and a pretty sick station that manages to keep you immersed while you're entering the vehicle. I could care less about the Marvel IP, but the awesome mix songs are a hoot, and hell, they actually got all the actors for the ride. It sounds expensive. I had decently high expectations, but I'll be honest with you, they were exceeded. This is definitely the best coaster in Disney World, and I cannot wait to ride it again. The boomer in me recoils a bit at the plastered IP in Epcot, and part of me rejects the premise of a roller coaster at Epcot in the first place, but I've been won over pretty soundly. Good job, guys. And that's all of the roller coasters at Disney World. Minus Tron, of course. What do you guys think? Do you agree with my rankings? Do you feel differently? Let me know in the comments. But there is one more thing. We've ranked everything according to the adjustments of the Disney scale, but where would these all fall if I were to rank them like the rest of my park rankings? Let's change the criteria a little bit, just make a little adjustment here and there, and there we go. Honestly, it's still not too bad. Disney World isn't a property geared for thrill seekers such as myself, obviously, but I'm not completely oblivious to the magic of good theming, and there are a few rides in here that actually manage to combine their good theming with enough actual thrills to land a spot in a low A tier. But honestly, like, what was the point of all this? We all know that roller coasters aren't the point of Disney World. The real point of Disney World is getting absolutely hammered around the world show. Thank you so much for watching, and guys, we did it! We hit a thousand subs and I'm monetized, which means I'm getting paid pitiful sums of money to make this content now. Yay! Uh, really though, I'm so happy we finally hit the major monetization threshold and I could not have done it without all of you. If you aren't subscribed already, thank you for coming in. I have a playlist with all these sorts of tier list videos and there are plenty more coming down the pipe. Also, go check out some of my more involved videos, such as my Crash Course videos or my Elegies while we wait for the next one. If you haven't subscribed yet, why not hop in for the ride? And as always, thank you for watching. Whoa, 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 whoa. Is this coaster enthusiast doing a video about Disney rides? I bet he still calls Hollywood Studios MGM. Well, I bet he's really into Space Mountain. I bet he liked Test Track better before the retheme. I bet he eats a lot of Dole Whip every time I bet he's he down has there. a really high score at I Toy bet Story he used Mania. to have Mickey ears as a kid. I bet he prioritizes living with the I land. I bet he's been to the cast member store.